So before starting the lecture, let me introduce our company briefly. Harmony Plus is an official partner of leading universities and institutions in the United States, such as UC Berkeley, Stanford International Research Institute, and San Jose State University. We are committed to providing top-notch programs to outstanding local and international students. We offer a variety of programs at Harmony Plus. First, the academic programs, such as reading and writing, AP chemistry, AP English literature and composition, ICT, ACT prep, college essay pre-writing, then the soft skill enhancement program, such as Future Entrepreneur Challenge, Public Speaking. We also provide the professor research programs. For example, Data Strategy, Kaggle Competition Training, Future CEO, Environmental Engineering and Sustainable Design, Global and National Public Policies and Strategies. I'd like to elaborate on several of the programs. The Nonfiction Reading and Writing Online Program which is tailored for fifth to eighth graders who want to develop interest in reading nonfiction tests and also improve their reading and writing skills for narrative, informative, and persuasive styles of writing. This program is also instructed by Dr. Glenn. Also, the Future Entrepreneur Challenge online program, which is tailored for middle and high school students who would like to receive the one-on-one -on -one guidance from entrepreneurs and VCs. They will even have the chance to land internship at high-growth startups. We also provide college counseling services, which is known as future planning. And a lot of our students have received the offers from prestigious universities in the US. Today, we're very glad to invite Dr. Glenn with us. So before introduce Dr. Glenn, I'd like to mention that in Harmony Plus, we adopt a hybrid learning platform, which combines the online with offline, school with students, theory with practice, education with services. Okay, so for Dr. Glenn, he is a senior coach at Harmony Plus. He got a BA from University of Notre Dame and MA from University of Hawaii. PhD major in education at University of Wisconsin. Glenn has over 10 years of experience teaching reading and writing, and also the, some other subjects to middle and high school students. Glenn has also successfully guided over 100 high school students through the college application process. Among these college applications, many students were admitted to top universities, including Harvard, Columbia University, Cornell, Stanford, UPenn, CIT, MIT, etc. So Glenn, would you like to say hello to the audience? Hello everybody. Thank you all for joining us today. Happy to be here with you. Thank you, Glenn. So in our today's webinar, we are going to talk about the importance of citizen journalism for students, how to write a good journalism op-ed article, the introduction to journalism editorial contest, the curriculum of citizen journalism program. And at the end of the webinar, we are going to have a Q&A session with each of the parents. So Glenn, would you like to share your experience about journalism writing and why is it so important for the students? I will leave the floor to you and you can start sharing your screens. All right, thank you, thank you. Cool, oh, that looks better. All right, so you are probably wondering, you heard a little bit about me, um, but you are probably wondering like, all right, you sound great, but why, why are you talking about journalism? Um, what, what does that have to do with me? So let me, let me tell you a little bit about myself to explain how I became aware of the importance of citizen journalism as a form of getting ready for college and beyond. Um, in other words, where did I find out this information? And since journalism is all about biases anyway and being upfront with those, I figure it's good to you know, lead by example and to share a little bit about my experience and why I think this stuff is so important. 
So um, I went to college at the University of Notre Dame, that beautiful university there um, in beautifully cold Indiana. Um, and when I found out there, uh, uh, when I got there, you know, one of the surprises to me was that so many of the assignments were essays. Um, but I, in high school, was only taught how to write essays in my English class. And so many of those classes, my classes how in English, didn't align to the way that I was asked to write uh, essays in so many of my other classes. And there's a difference between that, how you write for your social studies, how you write for your philosophy, how you write for your engineering, how you write for your sciences, is just different from how you write for English papers but so frequently our English classes don't teach us how to make this difference. Um, and that's a problem. They don't, they don't teach you how to read for uh, analysis. They don't teach you how to write for synthesis. They don't even teach you how to like annotate correctly. Like what are you supposed to be doing when actively reading? And so, you know, I being a, a giant nerd, like uh, I would just try and read everything. And I would just, you know, spend hours in the library and you would look at my, um, books and they were like oh highlight what you think is important and i would just have like entire pages highlighted because i wasn't able to differentiate and that wasn't because i was a good like i wasn't a good student like i was valedictorian of my high school class but i just didn't know there was this leap in college that is so difficult um and like that was a mess for me but i know it was a mess for a lot of other college students as well um and after learning about um education inequality I really wanted to get into like, okay, how can I make sure that my experience in education with getting into college doesn't, um, you know, is not the same as other people? How can we make this for better for others? And so I joined um, Teach for America. I'm not sure if you're all familiar with this organization, but it takes um, students from prestigious universities and sends them into classrooms um, so they can help teach. And that's, I was sent to Hawaii and this is me with my uh, college prep class. I'm, you know, the one Howley in the middle, and those are all my kiddos. Um, and like Hawaii, as any of you have been there, you know it's paradise. It's beautiful, but there's alongside that paradise is like real abject poverty um, and a school system that's really struggling. And so I taught, as mentioned, this college prep class where we tried to get kids to learn the best ways to get into college. And so here is where I learned how to teach writing, because if you can't, if you can't write effectively, you won't get into college. And more importantly, you won't persist in college. This is what I learned with essays, right? Like if you can't read and write effectively, you just won't do well. Um, but I also learned that good writing required good content. And good content meant understanding deeper issues. If you don't have the exposure to what's going on around you, um, if you don't understand, like in Hawaii, how it, this is like stolen land, this is how climate change impacts Hawaii, this is how these different socioeconomic forces have shaped my experience, then you don't have the critical thinking, the critical analysis in order to make that writing good. So it's both content and style. Um, but this is what like I knew education needed to be right like this this is what we need to get our kids to be able to do understand content understand style um, and be excited about their passions to see how they can use whatever passion they care about to make a difference in their community if you want to be a doctor like how are you going to be a doctor that makes Hawaii a better place if you want to be a computer scientist an engineer how are you going to use those interests to make your community be it Hawaii or be it the Bay or be it wherever you're at, like a better place. This is what I was really passionate and I discovered that passion in Hawaii. Um, and so after like teaching there and working abroad for a little while, I was like, mm, you know what I really need to do? I need to go someplace cold. Um, so I got a PhD um, at the University of Wisconsin, um, particularly focusing on this type of civic education. Um, and learning the best practices to get kids to be not only able to write well, but to understand issues and to apply it for their college applications and beyond. And now I'm trying to do that work back here in beautiful California. I'm tired of this uh, snow. So you might think, well, that's cool. That's a, you know, that's a great story. Um, what, is, what is that like 
got to do with citizen journalism and what does citizen journalism have to do with me getting into college? So citizen journalism is, what is this lovely definition? Uh, also known as participatory journalism, democratic journalism or street journalism. It's based on public citizens playing an active role in the process of collecting, reporting, analyzing, and disseminating news and information which is like, okay, I kind of see that connection between what you were talking about with your experience, but what's this got to do with me? Like, how does this affect me as a student, citizen journalism? Um, and it matters because there is currently like a huge dearth or a problem with civic engagement in this country. Young people don't vote. And this is like what this percentage, what this graph says, right? Like you're just not voting. They're not, and that's just the tip of the, the iceberg. They aren't engaged in issues. They aren't engaged in organizations. So there's a real like lack of deep understanding and deep participation in the civic, in civic life. All right, so why, why though? Why is there this lack of voting? And if you look at the next graph, um, the main reason why people say they're not voting, why they're not engaged, is because they don't understand enough about the issues. They don't know enough about the issues. This is the major reason, and it's for both men and women. And primarily, this is because they didn't learn enough about it in school to make a difference. And this is a huge issue for this country because young people need to be engaged in order to make a difference in the world. They need to learn how to do it. And that's exactly what citizen citizen journalism is all about, learning about the issues so that they can engage in the community. Um, but you might be thinking, okay, I see that's an issue. Great. All about kids voting, trying to get to vote. Um, but like, I'm a ninth grader. I can't vote until I'm 18. What does this have to do with me? Why am I sitting here? Uh, why should I care about this journalism? Um, and I think the primary reason for that is, well, just because you can't vote doesn't mean you can't make a difference in the world. You see that right now going on with all these like protests, all these movements, like kids are making a difference and that's beautiful. But also it matters to you because this is what colleges want you to be able to understand and to be able to do something about. Like colleges want you and require you to be like actually engaging in these issues. And you can look to see that, you can just look at these personal statement requirements, right? Uh, Common App Essay Prompt 4. This is one of the prompts that they are like asking you to do. Describe a problem you've solved or a problem you'd like to solve. It can be an intellectual challenge, a research query, an ethical dilemma, anything of personal importance, no matter the scale. Explain its significance to you and what steps you took or could be taken to identify a solution. This is a problem solution essay. What is the problem that you have encountered and what have you done about it? And although it says like, it doesn't matter the um, scale, let me tell you in terms of actually getting into the elite universities, that scale does matter. You actually need to be solving more than just like things going on with your own house and your friends. You need to be looking at the community because that's what it takes to get into these elite universities. And if you're thinking like, mm, I'm just going to, Common App don't apply to me, I'm going to be applying to UC system schools. Look at what the one of the ones on the UC system is. What have you done to make your school or your community a better place? Things to consider. Think of community as a term that can encompass a group, a team, a place, like your high school, your hometown, your home. You can define community as you see fit. Just make sure you talk about your role in your community. What was a problem that you want to fix in your community? Like this is absolutely what citizen journalism is all about. Like, how can I be engaged in my community? And yes, there are many options on these, but if you look at also what they value and who they accept into these schools, if you are not doing things to make your community a better place, you're really limiting your chances to get into elite universities. So that's why it's important for you because like you need to be doing this if you wanna be getting to college on top of the fact that like, this is important for the world. So um, in terms of like how this fits in with your academics, college applications are all about like this narrative arc. Think about colleges as a brand. Their graduates are how they market that brand, right? Like, oh, 
Uh, we just had like an elections in um, New York yesterday and there was Mondaire was a congressman from Stanford. I guarantee you Stanford is talking about like, oh, look at our, look at our graduates. They go on and become Congress people. This is what they try and project. So you need to do things that show that you are on this trajectory to greatness. Like here's where I am in high school. Here's what I've done in high school. And here's what I'm going to do in college to ultimately make me this great person. Like that is that narrative arc that colleges are looking for. So for example, let's say I'm passionate about video games. Great. Now I have actually taken the time to understand toxic gaming culture. This is what I've done in high school to actually address the issue of toxic gaming culture. I want to go to CIT to become a um, video game designer so that I can make video games that don't promote toxic video game culture. Oh, that's interesting. That's much different than every other person who's just saying they want to work in computers. Like, and that's that narrative arc that's important. You need to be able to describe your passion, talk about what you are doing to uh, push that passion and how you will be able to do that in the future. This is key for college admissions. Um, it's even more important these days, right, with the college admissions changing. I'm sure you all have been seeing this or reading about this, how schools are dropping their standardized test requirements for this year, but also that's moving forward. And this is wonderful in many ways. Like these standardized tests have been proven again and again that they're racist, that they like privilege certain types of information, and they really like limit who can get into schools. And so it's a good thing that they are decreasing their emphasis on standardized testing. And they are focusing more and more on socio-emotional intelligence. How do I understand the world and how does that world interact with me? How do I understand how I am and how I operate with the world? That is what they are focusing on. Those essays become even more important, which is why it's important to be able to do programs that align to that. How am I going to be actually engaged in some sort of activity where I am doing something to address my community? That's what it comes down to. Um, and so, so citizen journalism is definitely one of those things. Um, and then finally, like how it also matters, citizen journalism for like your academics and getting into college is you develop as readers and writers. And this goes back to that story I was saying in the beginning. How do we make it so that kids are as prepared for college and high school and able to persist in college? Because that's the issue is too often kids struggle in college, don't get the good grades, and like at worst drop out. Um, and then oftentimes they don't get the same sort of GPA that can let them get that good job or get into grad school. So we got to make sure they persist and thrive in college. And so citizen journalism gives them those skills as readers and writers. It allows them to focus on like improving their knowledge of issues, which is key for that content. It allows them to develop their skills of analysis and persuasion, which is key for writing. It develops those research skills. Um, it develops those advanced reading and writing skills as well. Um, so how, how does it do this? Um, how does actually writing for citizen journalism improve your reading and writing ability? Well, let's look a little bit deeper into those reading and writing skills so we can see how by writing quality op-eds, you actually become a better writer that can help you do well in college. Um, so there is like one of what makes a quality op-ed is having that problem and solution, similar to what shows up in your applications and similar is this like ability to I write, identify, and describe a, a, a problem, but also what is a solution to that. Those solutions and problems need to be based in academic research around reliable sources. Like it can't just be random websites, they actually have to be academic in nature. They have to have that editorial process. There also needs to be analysis and creativity around the problem and solution. So that is getting into those higher level thinking skills around on like Bloom's taxonomy. It's not just comprehension. It's not just describing a problem. It is getting to the root of it. And if you don't demonstrate those higher quality, those higher level thinking skills, you're not gonna have a good op-ed, but you can see how that also aligns to other types of writing. 
you got to be able to be organized. Good writing is organized writing. Organized writing has a thesis and topic sentences, just like any other essay will do in college. Those informational essays are very similar into that way. You got to be able to use logos, pathos, and ethos. Those are all key things to make your writing persuasive, especially that logos, that logic. How can I actually use stats and numbers to develop my argument? If you can't use logos in your writing, you're not going to be a good writer. This is key for journalism. It's key for writing. You have to be able to address counterclaims or counterarguments. That is also a key thing to be able to do for writing and getting into college. If you can't do that, you're not going to be able to actually persuade. You're not going to be able to understand the deeper issues. And then last, and I would actually say least, is clear grammar and spelling. This just like isn't that um, important anymore. And on, that is because like technology has laid it, made it so the kids don't necessarily need to learn how to spell effectively how to like have correct grammar because you can use websites like Grammarly that'll just fix it all for you. Um, or like, you know, anyone has seen the red underneath on Word, you just like right click it and fix it. So it is important to make sure that in the final product, this is there, but in terms of what the actual skills are that make it good, this is at the bottom. Um, unfortunately, it's too often what high school classes focus on is this like, oh, make sure you know how to like the correct particle, make sure you know your verb tenses, make sure you know like, uh, you know, you have pronoun alignment. This is like what the SAT focuses on, but this isn't necessarily what constitutes good writing anymore. It's a part, but technology helps you out. So you got to make sure that you can do all the other stuff as well, because technology isn't there yet. Um, so that's what makes a good op-ed article. Um, and if you're thinking about the college trajectory and like, how do I actually demonstrate that um, I am able to do this work and that I am great and I'm gonna be even greater after I go to Stanford or CIT, you need to be able to demonstrate that work or to show that. And that comes through applying to contests, to contests um, within, journalism within writing. And so this is that third part of our agenda. Um, these are a number of different editorial contests that you can apply to to get that. If you win, you get that stamp. Look, I'm a genius. Look, I won this contest. And so I think it's important for you all to know about these contests so that you can apply to them and so that you can get this stamp. The first one I want to talk about is the New York Times Student Editorial Contest. Uh, it is we just had the awards announced last week for the seventh annual. So the eighth is coming up. It is going to be in, it is typically in the spring of each year. You have this chance to submit these op-eds. Um, it is for any students 10 to 16 um, must use the teacher submission form. So you can be a middle schooler to submit. You can also submit as a high school. You can submit up to age um, 18. As long as you're in high school, you can submit. Um, and this I emphasize first because this is the gold standard. Like New York Times is considered by many to be the best newspaper there is. And so if they are saying, oh, you have an op-ed that could fit into our, um, our standards, you have a good op-ed. You put that on your um, resume, you put that in your applications, those college applicant uh, officers, application officers, admissions officers, was the word I was looking for, are gonna be like, whoa, this kid's brilliant. I gotta let this kid in. Um, and that's ultimately what you want to be doing. So this is the gold standard. This is what kids should be trying to get into. There are other ones too that I think you should be aware of. Well, look, oh, I got ahead. This, why it's the gold standard, this is what they're actually looking for. This is the rubric that I think it's helpful for you all to know because this can apply to a number of other different contests. Um, this is what makes a good op-ed, according to the New York Times. You gotta have a clear uh, call to action based through evidence. So that's what I was talking about earlier, that problem and solution. You have to be able to use reliable sources. You can't just be citing random websites. So that, that is a key thing. You need to have that analysis and persuasion counterclaims or counter arguments, relevant background information. If you can't understand the roots of the problem, 
then you won't be able to have a good essay. That's what that is getting at. So that's that content. You have to be able to understand the issues. Um, the language has strong voice and engages the reader. There's a language, a tone that is important. Um, and then there's also like they saying, grammar and spelling works, matters. So you gotta make sure that's true. You can use the computer programs to do that. And then it also you know, has to be cited from the times. What do you know? They want you reading their newspaper. Um, so that isn't to see that what I am saying is not based off of nothing. This is the actual content that they use. Um, and these are the winners um, of, who, of who won. I, this is the winners from the seventh. These are, this is the list of them. There is you know, lessons for a 2020 presidential candidate from a soon to be. There is a disabled teenager talking about social media. Nothing gets between me and my sushi except plastic. That is one written about how microplastics are showing up in people's food, especially in raw fish, and how that is bad. Cultural appropriation is critical to human progress. So that's coming from a conservative lens, like why we should be appropriating different cultures. There's that toxicity in gaming. So it doesn't matter what the issue is. Like there's stuff from all over. It doesn't matter. Um, whatever the passion is, as long as you can describe problems and solutions in it, you can write a great op-ed. And this is exactly what colleges want as well. They want people with creativity to be thinking about different issues. They don't want everyone to be the same, um, but it is all thinking about different issues. Every one of these things has an issue with it. Um, and that's why it's winning. Um, okay, so other contests. This is the Write the World, the annual op-ed competition. For any of you who are interested in writing, like this is definitely something that you should be um, aware of, this website. It's for an online communities, uh, for, t for students 13 to 18. You get them from around the world. They have different competitions throughout the year. So even if like op-eds aren't your jam, but you wanna be writing short fiction or you wanna be writing creatively, this is somewhere where you can still get that stamp. Um, they do always have um, cash prizes, which is always nice for kiddos. Uh, you get a first, you get an award for both first and runner up, I should say up. Um, but the key thing here is professional recognition of writers. Like by getting this, it is published, you get that stamp and you get feedback on early drafts from these professional uh, writers. They give you, like people who do this as a job, give you that lesson. So that is definitely something that you wanna be thinking about and signing up for. Um, and then the third one is this Carnegie Council International Student Essay Contest. This one is also very prestigious. Um, they give you a specific prompt. It is a little bit longer. The New York Times is 450 words. So that's why I think it's good for high school students to try and get that. Um, also, this one is open to all students. So you could theoretically be going against someone like me who is in grad school. And so it's a little bit harder to win these. But if you win, it's also like, whoa, this guy's a high schooler and he won um, or she won or they won. Um, and you get more cash prize, which is also nice. They give you a specific title. So if you're like, I don't know what I want to write about, this might be a way to be like, uh, oh, let me learn about something and potentially develop that passion. Um, so the other thing that I want you to be thinking about is uh, local media organizations. That is a place that you can definitely publish. Um, one of the things, uh, for any kids is like, okay, I need to get that stamp. How do I actually make sure that there is that stamp, that record that I can show to colleges about why I'm a genius? Um, and I would highly recommend writing and putting op-eds in your um, local media or news or uh, what sites. So this is literally what my um, college roommate did. That's how he got in is he would write reviews about things that were happening in his community. And he would give that analysis about it. He wrote a lot about churches and that worked well for Notre Dame. Um, and that's like one of the key ways that he got into college was those extra op-eds that he wrote. So the way to do this, you gotta look up your local newspaper. And as a high school student, 
it's easier to get into more local as possible. That's where you should start. Like if you're in New York, don't start with the New York Times, start with the Fort Lee. If you're in the Bay Area, you don't start with the San Francisco Chronicle. Start with whatever the local Palo Alto newspaper is. Just try and start as local as possible. Explore the website. You find that news organization, you explore the website, and you see if they actually have an op-ed section. You read any instructions if they have that, and then you submit. If you're like, mm, I don't know if they do op-eds. You know, the best way to do that is to reach out and contact them. If nothing else, they will be like, oh, this kid is actually interested in doing stuff for journalism, for getting in, interested in issues. So that is how you can also build your network. Maybe they'll have internships. Maybe they'll know of people where you can do this. Like always reach out when you are talking about um, just like trying and trying to reach out to organizations is a key way to get your foot in the door. And if you do that with an honest interest, like saying, hey, um, I'm a student who is passionate about video games and the effects of video games in, let's say, Palo Alto, do you, uh, and I want kids to be able to know about the impacts of video games, do you publish op-eds? And they will be like, oh, wow, this kid is really like interested in this and this kid cares. We don't do it, but here's an organization that does do it. Um, you don't want to be submitting like, hey, I need to write op-eds for college so I can get in. Can you publish my op-ed? They're not going to care about that. You have to be genuinely interested in it, which is a good thing. Okay. So how, and you're wondering like, okay, that's all great. I would like to be able to submit these op-eds. I want to get those stamps of um, genius on my forehead. I want to make sure that I am demonstrating this like trajectory of greatness for these colleges. I'm about that life. And I'm also like, hey, I, this also speaks to me as because I care about these issues. I'm not just trying to be here for college. I actually want to make a difference on the planet because the world needs it. Um, how do I actually develop those skills to make sure that I am a good uh, op-ed writer, that I have those critical reading and writing skills? That is the role of our class that we offer. Uh, it is a citizen journalism class in particular that we uh, have designed to help students be able to develop these skills. Are there other ways that they can develop those skills? I'm sure, like these are not unique, but this is one way where it is can be geared, it can be focused and you can get that guidance to helping those students develop those passions, develop those interests and develop those skills. The goals of the citizenship class that we teach, citizenship journalism class that we have are A, to improve students' reading ability. We, we focus a lot on comprehension, like can you actually understand these um, award-winning texts? Can you understand these high-level texts that are talking about issues? Once you get that comprehension, can you actually analyze them and synthesize them and argue against them and develop ideas and be able to combine different things? Those are those higher-level skills that are so important for students to be able to do. Um, how they do that is by learning how to like annotate and how to annotate effectively. One of the techniques that we use is called QCCing when commenting, uh, when annotating, which is question, connection, and um, comment. So these are ways that you can actually those, that's a format for how you actually annotate that can lead to better discussion, which is gonna be key in college classes or when you're at like some of these elite high schools and it's all about that Harkness model. How do I actually debate? How do I actually dialogue? You need to be able to QCC, pulling out the main points, but also interacting with those main points. That's what a lot of college classes are. That's what a lot of learning is. That's what we focus on giving those skills that ability to do. So they're not just going through and highlighting everything that they think is important. Also, we focus on students um, improving their writing ability. Like I said, college is all about, uh, a lot of the grades are based in essays. If you can't write well, you're not gonna do well in college. 
Also, if you can't write good personal statements, strong personal statements, you're not going to get into college because as we said, they're decreasing those standardized testing. They're focusing more on these essays. So we take a very holistic writing approach, meaning we're not focusing on like internal grammar so much. We are focusing on them being able to produce whole pieces of work. And then within that, developing those work through an iterative process. Iterative mean they're just doing drafts on drafts on drafts. This is how you become a better writer. You get feedback, you learn from your mistakes, and you fix those mistakes. It's not like a standardized test. What is the grammar? What, what is the correct way? What is a good um, topic sentence here? Like that's right or wrong? No, it's learning from your mistakes, improving your writing over and over again until it becomes natural. And so we give a lot of feedback, as I'm sure Alan can testify to. Like we are constantly, you, when you see your text, it's like, oh, wow, there's, there's a lot of effort that is put into it. And Alan takes his time to make sure that like the students and the parents understand the, the deeper lessons going on there. What is actually things that I need to improve on? Um, you also need to, we also focus on research ability. Um, Research ability is so key um, in being able to write these essays, but also to be able to do well in college. Um, we focus on the primary and the secondary research, which is something that a lot of courses don't do. They focus only on the secondary. Secondary is definitely the more important thing. Um, that is being able to like do those internet searches and we focus on getting kids to understand like what is the difference between a reliable source and a non-reliable source. A lot of kids will come in saying, oh, I, you know, like I don't use .com sites. I only use .orgs. .coms aren't as reliable. Um, and that's just like, that's not good a lesson. Whoever taught them that was wrong because clearly it's like New York Times .com. It's not a .org. Washington Post .com. Like these are .com sites that are reliable. Um, and so we focus on getting them to understand what are sites that have an editorial process. How can I differentiate between just a website from an organization that is pushing some bias or agenda and something that is supposedly trying to fact check, have that editorial review, make sure things are correct and present more facts than opinions. We don't even let them use like these organizations, even though we might like agree with them, if it's like uh, Sierra Club, right? This is an organization that does great environmental work, but they are still like, not, they don't have that editorial process. They are pushing an agenda around climate. We need to be able to stick the facts that we can cite. So it has to be those and getting kids to be able to realize that is a key lesson that they have to learn for when they get into college, but also for often in high school. Um, then we also, which is the fun stuff for the kids, is primary research. And normally, you don't get exposed to doing primary research. I think my first time was in college, and then in grad school, it was all the time. Um, but primary research is actually collecting that information. And so we teach our kids how to do quality surveys. We teach them how to do interviews. We teach them how to do observations. These are all things that like, if you're an actual journalist is what you're going to have to do. So if you want to become a journalist, great. But also for a lot of other fields, you have to be able to use those skills to collect information. Um, and they also align to a lot of socio-emotional intelligence, right? Like being able to give a quality interview is all about interpersonal skills. So if like we try and help them develop the opportunities to develop those interpersonal skills by having them learn what does an effective interview look like? What does an effective follow-up question mean? How do I like, um, how do I record this information? How do I analyze this information? So that is something that kids have said is a lot of fun um, and is also very useful. We also focus on trying to improve our understanding of issues. This is something that you have heard me saying again and again, it's content and organization, content and style. Um, a lot of the readings focus on issues that the students are interested in, but we try and deepen and broaden that interest. So like kids will say, you know what I'm really interested in? Food. Great. 
love when kids are interested in food because the issues around food are huge, right? So we'll get them exploring that thing about um, microplastics in sushi. We'll get them exploring food deserts. We'll get them to ex exploring um, how food and climate change interact. So these are deeper issues that show deeper analysis and require this higher level of understanding and to be able to write about them, that's what looks great for college. Um, we also try and get students to interact with them with this content and with these solutions and with the synthesis and with this analysis through doing a number of different activities. So we start off with Socratic seminar, which many of the students are familiar with, like bringing in different ideas, having those like uh, discussions, trying to get to the root cause of it. But then we also get into like debates where like, okay, what are the different, what is the better solution to this problem that we are learning about? What is the best way to stop a food desert? Um, and they get to debate it um, and like come up with, oh, well, I think this is the best, this is the best, um, which is key for also the, the op-ed. And then we also have what are called like solution chamber activities. So this is kind of like Shark Tank, if you've seen it, um, where kids have to, in groups, come up with their best solution to a problem and then they are presenting it and then other kids not debating it, they're just like voting on it. Okay, which of these would actually be the best solution to address this problem? Which by being able to talk about these things, analyze them verbally, as well as reading, as well as writing, allows them to fully develop those skills through a multimodal approach. And it's also fun for the kids, which generally when you're having fun, it tends to be a better class. Um, finally, they, uh, improve their chance of college admissions. This is definitely something that we want them to do. Um, we want them to be able to improve their application so they are as strong as possible. And that is why it is fully designed to developing their passions and interests. Like they get to choose whatever they're writing about. We try and expose them to different issues within those. But ultimately, this is about you writing about something that you are interested in. So one kid was interested in like bike lanes. He started writing about bike lanes. And now he might be petitioning his, uh, uh, his school, his, his community to be like actually addressing problems with bike lanes. Others are writing about video games. Others are writing about, uh, what is it, school homework. Because they're like, this is ridiculous that we are doing so much homework. How can I get my principal to actually allow me to have creative time? Um, so whatever the interests are and like if, that allows them to develop it and also get that opportunity to actually demonstrate that they are doing something. Because remember, in those essay um, applications, it was actually doing something. Um, so those are the goals. How we do it, again, it is aligned to the New York Times Student Editorial Contest. That rubric that I showed you is the same rubric we use in class. It is how I base feedback on the students. Um, they have to write two op-eds, so on two different topics in our class, because we want them to broaden them, like, oh, you're really interested in video games, but I also want you to be interested in something else as well, because you still gotta be developing those interests. Um, so we write two. The first one op-ed is entirely on secondary research that so we focus on making sure they can get that reliable sources the second one, they get to actually incorporate all those primary research, those interviews, those surveys, those observations. But the heart of this that I wanted to share with you is how we actually teach it. Um, the class format always starts off with a, um, with a uh, writing exercise based off of their experiences, meaning like we want to just get what they know. From those experiences and what their interests are, we can build and connect to. And this is like, this is a key uh, constructivist model of education, which builds from their knowledge and adds to it. You don't wanna just like throw in random stuff. You always wanna be building that wall, building that house of knowledge. Um, and it's good to see what, oh, get, get passionate about things. Um, then we do a reading on an issue that is like, we have aligned based off of their interests. That is either whole group or breakout. We start with whole group because we want to really make sure the students are actually developing those reading and comprehension and analysis skills. 
And once they get those skills, we're like, okay, now do this independently. So that's that sort of like uh, gradual release method of education. Then we will have that reading analysis activity. So those are the Socratic seminars, those are the debates, those are the solution chambers that you have to come up with ideas and present it. And then finally at the end, we're like, okay, how do I actually apply this? Um, this is the writing lesson where they actually then have to practice and they do most of their writing outside of class because I, you know, people write at different speeds, people write at different rates, let them do that outside. Um, and then they get feedback on those actual writing. Um, so that's what our class looks like. And I think it is firmly geared to helping the kiddos develop those passions, develop those reading skills, so they can ultimately get into college, because that's the end goal, but also persist in college and become a student and citizen who is able to shape the world around them and be an intelligent, thoughtful, global citizen. So that's what our class is. That's the importance of citizen journalism. Um, please let us know if you have any questions. I'm going to give it back to you as soon as I figure out how to do that. Oh, that's what I'm looking for here. Stop sharing. OK, thanks so much, Dr. Glenn. So you talked a lot about the citizen journalism and also how important it is for students' uh, future application and also their reading and writing abilities, right? Yep. So I know that uh, you are also instructing the nonfiction reading and writing class. So can you tell us a little bit about the difference between these two courses? And if students want to you know, learn more about the nonfiction class, can they also attend the nonfiction class? Yeah. The way I see it, uh, this is sort of like a follow up to the nonfiction reading. Like the reading and writing is our 101 class, right? We're going to give you uh, knowledge on narrative writing. We're going to give you knowledge on informational writing. And we're going to give you knowledge on persuasive writing. Uh, those are like our three units in that class. And it's like a, a, a teaser on each one of those. Here's less information, like your 101 knowledge. The citizen journalism is the 201 class on that third unit persuasion, op-ed writing. So you actually write an op-ed in uh, the persuasion, in the nonfiction reading writing class, but we go hard on it within the citizen journalism class. We teach you all these different ways. We give you different models of organization. We really like take the gloves off and let you write about all sorts of things. So yeah, you get to experience different things in that non, uh, non-fiction reading and writing. This is that more advanced model. Um, and if you're like, hmm, I don't know which model I'm more interested in yet, highly recommend signing up for the uh, non-fiction reading and writing. You get good access there. Uh, you get a good exposure there. And then you can be like, oh, I actually really want to be doing creative writing. Or I really want to be doing this sort of like op-ed. That's the most fun. So that's the difference. Great, great clar clarifying question there, Alan. Yeah, thanks. So the nonfiction reading and writing and the citizen journalism, they are also aligned. So after students got to learn different types of the writings, they can also learn the difficult, the advanced part that is the citizen journalism. So hereby, I would like to introduce everyone our uh, course schedules. For the citizen journalism, we're mainly targeted on the ninth, 10th graders, and also some excellent maybe eighth graders. And the class will start from July the 2nd to July the 30th, every Tuesday and Thursday from 4 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. And for the students who are more interested in the nonfiction part, we're going to have the class that starts actually tomorrow, uh, every Tuesday, Thursday from 1.30 to 3 p.m. Both of these courses are instructed by Dr. Glenn. So if you have any questions, you can also leave your questions in the chat uh, box. We're going to answer all of your questions right now. So Dr. Glenn, you mentioned about in our class, students will do a lot of researches, especially the primary research. So I heard that there are like the interviews, the surveys, the observations, Mm -hmm. Can you give us several examples about how the student did the primary research? So for the interviews, 
uh, a lot of it is like they'll just ask their their family members because it's like you're I'm in quarantine. What who do I actually ask? Some people would like reach out to like family friends or whatnot, and this is great. This is a first like this is I would recommend a good place to start off with their friends or their family members because it's low risk, um, high reward. I get to learn how to do it. And I don't burn any bridges. Like your first interview should not be with somebody who you like uh, has like a, as a gatekeeper to jobs and internships or like, you know, might be a letter of rec. So start off with their family and that's good. They get that, they get that habit of, oh, this is, this is how I ask follow up. So that's where, that's where they start off with. The observations being in quarantine is a little bit difficult. Sometimes they would just like, and this is useful, like, just being able to sit outside and look at a, outside a window and try and develop theories about what is going on is such a key skill. Like, why did this neighborhood become the way this is? Why do these like cars show up in the way that they do? Um, that sort of emergent theory is very key in grad school, definitely key in uh, college. And so being able to think of theories is a key skill. Um, and then surveys, they, they wrote about all these different issues and they would send it out to their friends and they, they love that as well. So uh, as we mentioned, the citizen journalism, we mentioned it's mainly for the ninth and the 10th graders. So Glenn, if there are students who are excellent, maybe uh, middle schoolers, can you also, you know, recommend them, you know, to uh, attend the class? Yeah, like we all know that your age might not necessarily align to what your reading writing ability is. That's kind of a archaic system. And so we definitely allow more banded models of education where if you are doing, you're killing it in middle school, there's no reason why you can't uh, sign up for these, uh, for the citizen journalism class. Like, absolutely. Yeah, so we will have like a one hour interview with the students if the students, you know, have a very excellent ability in reading or writing so that we can know that if he or she is perfect for the program. And also that's the same for the nonfiction reading and writing, right? I, I believe so. Uh -huh. Okay, great. So uh, for the Zoom outings, if you have any questions, you can also turn on your microphone and start asking the questions. So Dr. Glenn will like interact with each one of you. Uh, individually. Uh, so Glenn, uh, I know that in the class students will have some homework after class. So what is the amount of the homework students have to do after each class? Yeah, I mean, I think it varies on the kid in terms of their like writing um, speed. Uh, but it, we try and keep it manageable, right? Like we, we, we are of the notion that kids just burning out on doing too much stuff doesn't like they do. They're doing so much other stuff, which is great. Um, so we try and like limit it to probably like an hour, I would say is what, is what you would get out, out of the most. Um, yeah. And so it's a, it's a Tuesday, Thursday. So we definitely give less homework in between the Tuesday and the Thursday and give more homework over the longer weekend because they have more time to be doing stuff. So those like major writing assignments, um, will happen over the weekend um, because we know you all are busy and it's a summer, um, but we do recognize that like you can't actually get better unless you do it. So we, we, we balance those two things pretty well. Um, and if you have extenuating circumstances, we will actually differentiate this. We've had kids who are like, I'm bored. I don't have anything to do. And we'll give them like, oh, read this, read this, write this. Um, they're like, yes, love it. We're doing more. Or we had kids who are like, uh, I'm actually taking 20 classes right now and I can't get this done. Is that okay? Yes, that's totally okay. You know, get it to us when you can. We don't assign you a grade in this class, right? This isn't like your, your high school class where you get an A, B, C, or D. This is all about you just learning. So we are very much adaptive to your needs. Mm -hmm. And after actually each of the students assist, uh, Dr. Glenn will provide very extensive greetings and the feedback to the students. And I think that's the part where students can grow and increase their abilities a lot. And Glenn, do you have some uh, great books for the students to read during the summer? I mean, can you recommend one or two books for them? I mean, I think this, the perpetual question, right? Um, one thing that I would recommend them reading, like, 
it always depends on whatever the, whatever their interest is, right? What what is their initial spark? If it's history, if it's science, whatever that subject is, and then finding something that aligns to that, but finding something that pushes their thinking within that, that exposes them to something more. Um, like what did we? What was that with Olivia? Like sometimes it's just like, oh, I really just like reading stories. Okay, so let's give you stories of, of people who are actually interacting with different issues in their community. And that's one thing that I would um, highly recommend. It shouldn't just be like <laughs> the, the book that, what is it? Uh, it shouldn't just be that it was like throwaway. Um, I would recommend reading would be non-fictional texts that expose them to different issues. Um, like the more things that you can actually expose them to and give them awareness of, especially in these times of like pandemic and like racial unrest, like getting them to understand what's going on with that is key. Especially if you're a junior right now and you're like gonna be thinking about applying to colleges and you don't, if you can't articulate how either coronavirus or like racial injustice shows up in your world, you're, you're like doing yourself a huge disservice in terms of application. So anything around those key issues that touches on those issues is what I would recommend. Okay. Uh, yeah. And uh, also we will uh, send some recommended book list in our WeChat group later. So if you are interested in the receiving the book list and also receiving the PowerPoint slides, you can scan this QR code to join our WeChat group. So after the seminar, we're going to share the PPT power slides to the WeChat group and also share with you some of the books recommended by Dr. Glenn. So if you have any questions, you can also feel free to ask us in the WeChat group. So during the citizen journalism class, so after the nine sessions of study, how do you think the students have progressed? I mean, can you talk about some very impressive progress by the students you have witnessed? Yeah, I mean, we had kids the key thing that we saw was a deepening of the analysis of what is going on, right? Like their writing got way better in terms of organization, in terms of analysis, in terms of structure, that's key. And that's like, that's what we hope. But we also saw, which was very cool, was the like depth in which they were understanding issues. Kids would be like writing about, oh, what, what do I, what's an issue with food? Uh, I guess people are hungry is what they would be like writing about. And then they would be talking about, oh, these are the root causes of food deserts. And this is what we should be doing about food deserts. Stuff that like I didn't learn about until college. These kids were able to articulate key solutions that aligned to best things that I had heard about, um, why they thought it was, and like actually aligned to like the causes of things. It was incredible the amount of depth that students were able to do on analysis. Um, and this was like middle school. You could like in high school, I'm even more excited to see what they can do because they just have had more exposure. Um, so yeah, like it's the amount of growth that is possible if you were writing about things that are interesting is really cool. And they all were like, this is what I'm gonna be doing next. This is my goal for like, I'm gonna get this published here. This is where I want to like, I wanna keep refining this and then do something about this. So you see that college trajectory in action, which I think is a really cool thing. Yeah. Okay. One last question due to the time limit. You mentioned that there are a lot of debatings and the classroom activities in the class. Yeah. So how can the students do debating, you know, help them with their writing? So this is that like uh, multimodal approach, right? Um, some students are better at uh, analysis through speaking. Some are better at actually writing, but th like, those are the same part, those parts of our brain are connected. So by getting them to be, oh, okay, first I'm articulating that verbally. Oh, I'm seeing how this analysis should work. This helps my, my written part. And the same goes through opposite with writing. By writing about it, I actually get stronger with verbal. Like the two are connected. So that's why it's like simultaneously upgraded. Okay, thanks so much, Dr. Glenn. So I think now after the seminar, uh, we still have some parents uh, staying here. So I want to ask each of the parents, so do you have any questions? We can talk with you individually. And Dr. Glenn would also like to answer your questions. So you can feel free to turn on your microphone or camera. Uh, 
，在座的家长不知道现在有没有什么问题，可以跟啊、uh, Glenn 老师一起沟通一下。啊、uh, ，You can also ask the question in Chinese or English. I will help you communicate with Dr. Glenn. Definitely stick around if you have any other questions.、Um, if not, I, you know, if you have to go, we do recognize that time. We want to thank you for spending this hour with us, and hopefully, this was informative. Hopefully, it's something you can talk to, you know, your students about、um, and be aware of. But definitely stick around if you got questions. Okay, our lecture for today is officially finished. If there are any parents in the group, you can now communicate with us individually. So our lecture has officially concluded. If you have any other questions, you can stick around and have the one-on-one -on -one communication with us. Thanks so much for your、uh, participants, and thanks so much, Dr. Glenn. Of course.